Hey guys, I'm back with my new painting and a brand new video. Since I got some pretty good feedback on my Moroccan merchant where I narrated the entire process, I wanted to take that concept further by making this video more than twice as long and quite a bit more advanced. So throughout this video, I step out in front of the camera and explain some little concepts here and there, and I also include some real-time footage, which is something that's new for me. So I hope you guys like this more complex, more long and informative video. Let me know in the comments, please. So this is my grandpa, Pavel Mikhevich Pushin, same first name as me, and he's a World War II veteran. I've painted him twice before and my grandma once before. And in fact, this photo, which I took on Victory Day, which is May 9th in 2013, I've painted this one before, but digitally. This was over six years ago, so quite a bit of time has elapsed and I wanted to come back to this work and remake it in oils. My focus here was to make sure that this painting comes out looking like a painting. So what I mean by that is oftentimes artists get complimented, oh wow, your painting looks just like a photo. But that's not actually a great compliment because we want our paintings to look like paintings. So to do that, I had to develop a new way of thinking about it and a new approach where I tried a lot of new things that I haven't tried before. I used a lot of thick palette knife strokes. I built up texture through multiple layers and I used a lot of glazing. And this process has taught me a lot about painting in a more loose and more courageous way. And I'm gonna carry on these concepts in my future works. And I hope you guys enjoy these videos because one thing I thought about is how fun would it be if every time you make a large painting, you record a video and you record what you thought and the entire thinking process and your methodology. And then imagine going back to it five or six or seven or 10 years later and then seeing what did I used to think like back then? How did I approach my paintings back then? And then you get to see how your mentality and your method and your approach evolved over this time. So for that reason, I think I'm gonna keep making these vlog style videos. So let me tell you a little bit about my grandpa and his World War II experience. Unfortunately, he didn't really like to talk about it because he felt like he didn't do enough. But let me tell you what little we do know. My grandpa was only 17 when he was drafted to the Soviet army in December, 1944. And you can see in this photo, this is him when he was drafted. He's basically a baby. Usually it's illegal for soldiers to be drafted prior to the age of 18 to go fight. And he was 17. So why is that? That's because Russia largely ran out of men by the end of World War II. So by the end of 1944, they had no choice but to recruit children. He was also much too short for his rifle. He was under the height of the rifle, which is also illegal. That's because when he was growing up, he was quite hungry, so because of the poor nutrition, he never really made it to a decent height. They got taken to Germany-occupied Poland, where they slept in a destroyed factory in inadequate clothing. It was way too cold, their shoes weren't working. It was too wet and too cold, so their feet were constantly freezing. So what they did was they cut some wooden blocks and taped them to the bottom of their shoes, kind of like Japanese samurai. My grandpa's job was to be an artillery man, which is to fire flak cannons onto incoming German planes. So this means that he's not a foot soldier on the front lines of infantry battle, but he's kind of off in a strategic location in the background shooting down planes. This meant that he didn't really run into foot soldiers that much, but he did get bombed by planes constantly. So they just had to dig out some trenches and lay in them and hope when the bombs fall that they don't land on them. But to be fair, it went relatively okay, as, as okay as war can go. And he got away without any problems except for one accident. So to fire a flat cannon, you have two or three people working on it. His partner is responsible for putting in the shells, the bullets of the cannon. And his partner put in one shell, forgot about it, and then put in another one like an idiot. 
They didn't know, so my grandpa pressed fire and the whole thing exploded and it sent shrapnel into both of them. So they were wounded by themselves, basically. But other than that, it went pretty okay. Here's a photo my grandpa had of somebody that he fought with. It says, don't forget me on it. I actually painted this photo in my first painting of my grandpa. After Poland, he was taken to fight in Berlin which he didn't talk about much, so we don't really know what happened there. The war was soon over, and he fought for one year since he was so young, and he came into the war so late as a result of that. You'd expect that after the war is over, you get to go home, but instead he had to serve for 10 more years until he was 27. This is because Russia had no more men left. But overall, the war went pretty okay for him, there's only one minor wounding accident that they caused themselves. And I think he got lucky because of his young age. This went a lot worse for a lot of other people who never came back or came back disfigured. But for him, it went okay. And for this reason, he actually never felt proud of his war contribution. Every year on Victory Day, the Kremlin has a parade of veterans and they invite some of the veterans to actually the Kremlin and maybe to meet Putin. But my grandpa was invited several times, but he never went because he felt embarrassed and felt he doesn't deserve to stand next to those that had more time in the war than he did. All right, let's start painting. Before this painting even began, I wanted to make sure that it comes out more loose and energetic than my usual work. I wanted to stay away from doing a tight very specific drawing, and I wanted to go for something more energetic. So I put on some crazy electronic music, which helps me paint loose, and I went for it. I used Gamsol to thin down the colors and got this done in just two hours. After a two or three month break, I went traveling and had some paid jobs that I had to do. I came back to this painting and I started with the first layer of the portrait. Since I wanted to paint this painting in multiple layers, I wasn't trying to get this first layer super correct as far as the drawing goes. On this first layer, I was focused with laying down the correct values, colors, and edges of the portrait, and I knew that some of the drawing will slide, but that's okay because I plan to fix it in future layers. So here it is, the first layer of the portrait. So now I'm working on the second layer of the portrait and I'm working on top of paint that probably dried overnight because uh, this Clausen's 13 linen, I find it uh, dries the earth tone paints in about one night. So now that I'm working on this, the goal here is to actually get the drawing right. So you see me fixing a lot of things that I got wrong on my first layer and adjusting little edges and fighting with the glasses. I wanted to make sure that the lights on his skin and in his hair are loaded with paint and are very thick compared to the shadows. So pretty much every time you see me working on something light, each time I touch it, I'm loading up more paint. So it's a new day and I'm back to working on my painting. I see that overnight, all the work that I did yesterday has sunken in. So what that means is that the first layer of the paint that I did the first day has grabbed the oil from the next layer that I did yesterday and has taken all of it to make it dull and light, like you can see in the eyes, particularly in the nose and in the mouth. So this is prone to happening with our earth-based paints like raw umber, transparent brown oxide, which are a lot of the paints that I used in the flesh tones. So right now we can't actually continue working on the face because we're not seeing the true values of the paint. So to fix it, we need to oil it out. I like to use walnut oil, but you can use poppy seed oil, linseed oil. It doesn't matter. You could even splash some Gamsol, but since that evaporates quickly, I think it's better to use an oil. So here I am applying my walnut oil to the parts of the portrait that I feel dried wrong. So you can see that the colors are becoming rich again, the darks are becoming darker, and the colors more saturated. 
So here it is before I applied it. And here's how it looks after. Now that it's oiled out, I can start my session for the day. So I started by painting the missing ear and working on that cheek. As I paint the lights on his forehead and the hair, I'm trying to load it up as thick as I can. You can see me applying palette knife to the hair right above the glasses to make it as thick as I can. I'm having the same struggle as I did during my Moroccan merchant portrait with the glasses and trying to get the two rims to match up to each other. So you see me adjusting that often. I wanted a very soft edge where the hair merges with the skin so it doesn't look like a toupee that it feels like the hair is growing on the head. One of my main focuses for this painting was to make sure that it's going to look like an actual painting and not a photograph. So to do that, I decided I'm actually going to use some paint. I grabbed more white than I'd probably use in an entire painting all at once, mixed it with some pastel colors and some earth tones to create some palette knife strokes on the background. For this, I was thinking of artists like Fetchin and Jeff Watts and about creating an energetic, crazy background. I've never tried this before and I don't use the palette knife often enough, so you're gonna watch me trying something for the first time. Let's see how it goes. So here I go applying some pretty brave palette knife strokes and trying to use as much paint as I possibly can. I put on some electronic music again because it helps me paint more loose for some reason, so I need it for times like this. Here's some more or less real-time videos so you can see me applying the strokes exactly how I did it. This is a more of a happy accident type of methodology, and I'm particularly happy with this accident. The way this crazy red shape that I just made looks is not something that I could think to paint on purpose or would even know how. Ooh, I really like this little accidental rainbow colored stroke that I did up there. I'm coming in with a big brush to kind of create a different texture so it's not all palette knife texture and to break down some of the palette knives for a more variety. At least that's what I'm thinking. I wanted to bring in some small bristle brush strokes to contrast with the big palette knife marks. I just put down a very thick palette knife stroke going right up against his cheek and creating a sharp edge of the shoulder against the background and I'm very happy with how that turned out. I was quite scared to do it because once it dries, you can't really remove it. Now that I worked on the background, it's time to go back into the figure and give a little bit more shape to that arm. So I'm starting to model it here a little bit and taking care of the drapery. I'm keeping in mind where my light is coming from, which is the left and above, and using it to make sure it looks as 3D as I can get it. It's time to paint the metals on the left side of his suit. This is definitely my comfort zone because it involves rendering little details. 
I'm using Indian yellow a lot for the red yellows of these meadows. And big thanks to Ivan Loginov who got me this paint when I visited him in St. Petersburg. Thanks, Ivan. The star-shaped metal was really fun because it has this little hammer and sickle in it, which was a great time to paint. All right, it's time for the hands, which a lot of people call the second portrait in your portrait. The hands, they say a lot, and in this case, his hands are in the process of movement as they're closing up his blazer. They're about to button a button or something like that. So in order to feel the movement of those hands, I wanted to make sure to give it these crazy edges. The shirt is entirely submerged in shadow except for that one collar there. So I expect it to have pretty much all soft edges. So I try to focus on that and make sure there's uh, not too many hard edges in there and that the value range is very tight. So nothing ends up jumping out of the shadow except that part of the collar and the buttons which are catching highlights. Victory Day is one of Russia's biggest holidays of the year. It's on May 9th and it commemorates when the Soviet Union defeated Nazi Germany. This ribbon is what Russians wear on May 9th to remember our veterans. The Germans signed the Instrument of Surrender late in the evening of May 8th, 1945, but that was after midnight Moscow time, hence why it's celebrated on May 9th. The Soviet government announced their victory early in the morning of May 9th after the signing ceremony in Berlin. Hitler himself has given up about 10 days prior by committing suicide along with his wife in his bunker on April 30th. Here I'm trying to use the palette knife to scrape the paint that I just laid down to give it some kind of broken edges and a bit of texture. I'm trying to expose the canvas in some places as well. With this I was having a hard time finding a compromise between lost crazy edges but making sure that the metals still look like a circle. Because sometimes when I blow out the edges, it just stopped looking circular. A lot of paint was removed during that scraping process. So now I'm going back in with some thick palette knife strokes on top of these metals to give it some of that thickness back. The more I can accomplish a thick texture on these metals, the cooler it's gonna look when I glaze into it later on as the glaze will go inside the pits of the paint. A lot of various accidents happen throughout the scraping and palette knifing process. So now I'm going back in with the brush to fix the shape of these metals to make sure that, that they come out as a circle. And I'm painting the ribbons a little stronger as well. Just painting that closer arm to us now and uh, the sleeve, the collar, and some of the background now, nothing too exciting. This is Safflower Alkid oil painting medium, which is something that I use when I wanna glaze something. So I pour a little bit out and I mix some paint into it that I'll use to glaze an area of my painting. And they say on the bottle that your mixture has to be mostly paint. I don't know if I adhere to that because then uh, the glaze is too dark for me, but let's apply it and see what happens. There's a lot of texture on this uh, blue mark when I initially painted it. So I think it can look like a lot of fun once we glaze it. I'm doing some small stuff now. I'm looking for creating some sort of electric edge to this white line. This green blue object is actually a reflection of a bed. So this is actually a mirror and uh, we're seeing part of the bed here that I just didn't like the brown the way it looks. So I palette knifed over it and left it abstract and try not to worry about it too much. Now we're in the final stretch of this painting and we got to put the finishing touches on this thing. So even though at this stage you can call the painting done and it would be okay, 
you got to sit down and be as critical as you can. So what I like to do at this stage is maybe ask some artist friends for critique. Although I didn't do it on this piece, I sat down with myself and had an open mind and asked myself, what jumps out? What can be improved? What are some of the little things that are taking away from the piece that we could get rid of? And what are some of the things that we could add to make this as perfect as it can be? So in this case, one of the biggest problems that I see is that this shoulder is significantly longer than this one, which is true in the photo. It's about 33% longer because my grandpa is pointing his shoulder at us towards the camera and the other sh shoulder is going away. But I find it feels a little bit weird in my painting. So to get rid of that feeling, I'm going to need to drag some of this background into the arm here to reduce that shoulder and make it feel normal. Another big thing is that the metals here, I like how I painted them, but they're quite light. So they're jumping out of the shadow and they're calling a lot of attention. So it's making it a little bit harder to pay attention to the portrait, which is the most important part. So to help with that, I'm going to glaze these metals down with maybe a raw umber or a greenish umber to bring them back down into the shadow. I feel that this collar here is a little bit too high and too close to the ear. So I'm going to reduce that from here and bring it down to here while trying to maintain this cool stroke that I pulled right over here. I think that the background here, I went pretty crazy with it and it's a new thing I tried. I wanted to be bold and I was thinking of artists like Fetchin and Jeff Watts where I wanted a really energetic background, but I kind of seemed to have lost that courage a little bit when I was painting the figure, well, which is to be expected. But it's important that our figure and our portrait feels one with the background, so it's one cohesive whole. So in order for it not to feel fragmented, I need to bring some of this craziness into the figure and into the portrait. So I think I'm gonna dry brush some crazy textures from the background into the suit here and there. And I'm gonna pull a big thick palette knife stroke across the hair right here. Another thing that I'm thinking is the light is coming from above and to the left. So what would be nice is to have this part of the sleeve feel like it's receiving more light. So we can kind of roll the cylinder of the arm like this. So I'm gonna take this little section and brighten it up. And lastly, this is not a big deal. It's just a fun little thing I want to try. I painted some of these white strokes with a very thick textured paint with some deep grooves because I used a bristle brush. And I want to glaze into them with a Viridian or a Cobalt Blue just because it will give them a cool electric feeling and maybe it will look nice. We'll see. I don't know. I've never tried it before, so let's give it a shot. So I think after I make these changes, we'll be able to call this painting finished. So here I go on my finishing touches and I'm lining up the top of the sleeve to help the top of it receive more light because that's where the light is coming from. So we'll have a more believable cylinder of the arm. I want to pull a thick palette knife stroke on the hair to echo some of the things I did in the background. So here I go and I apply that first shot at it and it's too dark so I come back in using more white and I try to adjust the shape and the more I touch it the more it gets out of my control. It's quite nerve-wracking to do. I realize that palette knife strokes have hard edges but hair has soft edges so I'm forced to come back in with a brush on the end of these palette knife strokes and to break them down to give it a softer edge so that at the end, this still feels like hair. It's very possible that the more I touch it and the more I chase after something, the worse it gets because we're breaking down the natural quality of the paint as it's put down. And generally as a rule, you wanna put down the paint and not touch it again tends to get worse when you do, but I haven't learned my lesson with that. So I'm keeping applying more, keeping on trying to get it to look like something.
My mom came to visit me and had a look at the painting and noticed that the metals are way too small. So I agreed with her and I had to spend some time increasing their size. I'm moving down the lapel of the suit to give more space between the ear and his shoulder while maintaining that cool blue mark that I like. I'm also getting rid of this weird blue sausage I have in the background because I'm not even sure what it is. It's hard to see in this video, but I'm doing some stuff to that blue thing and then I'm applying some texture to the sleeves. Since that part of the background is supposed to be light going through the window, I decided I ought to dry brush some lighter texture on top of the dry paint. As I do this, I kind of hold my brush lightly and paint only on top of the grooves of the old paint to maintain the darker paint underneath to create this more interesting multi-layered texture. It's time for that safflower oil again so that I can glaze down the metals and some of those white textured lines that I painted in the background. So here I am mixing the browns for the metals that I'm gonna glaze down. And here's some green for those white lines that I wanna make look kinda of electric. You can see that glaze darkening the metals and that dark paint going into the grooves of the thick textures that we created earlier on. Here comes that viridian green glaze and you can see it going into the pits of the paint. I'm gonna use my finger here to rub off the top layer of the glaze to reveal the white underneath to create a stronger contrast in the texture. So I'm just applying some different glazes to the white lines in the background. Just trying to make it a little more exciting. And we're done, so it's time to sign it. And for that, I'm gonna go into my rosemary brushes cabinet and pick out a brand new brush because the tip is very important in the quality of the signature. And I find that when I use older brushes, I just struggle a lot. So here's me signing it with a brand new rosemary brush, which makes it a lot easier. After waiting a few days for the painting to dry, it's time to varnish it. So the reason why we do this is because you can see the paint dries differently in different areas of the painting. This depends on the medium that I use while painting it or how many layers a certain area is compared to another, as well as what paints you used. For example, the earth tones dry more dull than say a cadmium yellow. So varnish helps bring it all together and make it look fresh like it was just painted just now in one go. So here's the finished piece. And as you can see, it's uh, quite a bit different from my usual outcomes. It's got a lot more textures going on, thickness, I'm playing with the paint. The edges on these hands in particular, I'm very happy with as they convey movement. Here you can see how the glaze affected the metals and the texture in them. Um, these little guys were fun to paint. But yeah, overall, I'm pretty happy with this and I'm gonna take elements of how I painted this and bring it into my future work. I don't know if I'm always gonna go as crazy on the background as you can see I did here, but it's something to apply here and there in the future. I think this is one of those paintings that is much better experienced in person, but I hope this video help you get a, some sort of feel for it. Thanks for watching that guys, I really appreciate it. And please let me know in the comments if this longer format is okay with you and if you found it entertaining or if perhaps it got too long. So let me know. In fact, I'm actually recording my next large studio painting right now. So there's gonna be another video coming out probably within a month. So if you guys like this sort of stuff, please hit like, give me some feedback and subscribe. Cheers.